Welcome back, this is Dr. Jen Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. Today we're going to talk about smell. Can smell be a predictor of early onset of Alzheimer's, dementia, and Parkinson's disease? Let's get right into it. Smell impacts cranial nerve number one. Cranial nerve number one is actually the shortest cranial nerve and can be a predictor of early onset of memory loss or Alzheimer's and dementia. Smell or aromatic aldehydes from fruit, poop, uh, stagnant water, the smell will go into the nasal cavity. From there, it stimulates the olfactory epithelium and the mucus that uh, surrounds it. And the mucus will trap these aromatic particles and will stimulate the olfactory neurons. Once the stimulation of the olfactory neurons occur, it will go through a bony area of the, of the skull called the cribriform plate and impact the olfactory bur a bulb and olfactory nerve and it will travel to the olfactory cortex. Now, there are many fancy names for uh, different parts of the olfactory cortex. I'll just go over a few of them in a second. But humans can smell up to 10,000 different things or identify 10,000 different smells. Smell triggers saliva production as well as taste. So there's a saying, taste is 80% smell. If you've ever been sick and you have a sinus infection, you lose your sense of smell and things don't taste right. You kind of lose your appetite or things that should taste good taste like burnt toast. So it really depends on how the nerves are firing at the time. Now, when we look at it, the smell will spread to other parts of the brain. One part is called the temporal lobe, and the temporal lobe is uh, responsible for identifying what the smell is. You smell and go, oh yeah, that is, I know what that is, lemon, lime, okay, uh, campfire. The hippocampus actually has a memory of the smell, right? So you can associate certain emotions or certain feelings that you might have experienced when you had a certain smell. So like a perfume, if you associate that perfume with someone you uh, went out with when you were in high school, then you can, it brings back memories of that. So the hippocampus is the memory of that smell. The frontal lobe will identify it consciously. So if you can't identify it immediately, your brain goes, hmm, I think it's this. It's actively trying to identify what the smell is. Now, the amygdala, or the emotional centers, right, such as fear, can be also stimulated. So if you smell smoke outside while you're camping, you don't really think about it. But if you smell smoke in your house while you're sleeping, all of a sudden the fear centers will go up. So you'll have an emotional response you might also have a sympathetic response related to smell. Also, if you have a, another example of perfume, uh, let's say you dated someone who was really mean and who, who really uh, was a bad person, right? If you smell that perfume or cologne, then all of a sudden it brings back those bad memories and, and has a emotional response. Now, there is a condition where you can lose the sense of smell. It's called anosmia, and it's called absence of smell. You can have temporary loss of smell because things like common colds, COVID was very common, infections, sinus infections, and so forth. You can have a temporary loss of smell. You can have permanent loss due to head injury where you can actually fracture the cribriform plate where the neurons go through. Infection, uh, I'm sorry, tumor. You can have a tumor in the nerve and it can impact it permanently. Degeneration, Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's disease. So neurodegenerative processes can impact smell. Now, what are some simple screening processes that you can do at home to determine whether you have 
early onset of memory loss or Alzheimer's dementia Parkinson's. There are three different smells that has been widely studied. Coffee, peppermint, and anise. Now everybody knows what coffee is, peppermint is. Anise is an herb and unless you've smelled it before you might not identify it. So you can use coffee, peppermint, and let's say something else like cinnamon to do a smell test. What you do is you block one nostril, close your eyes, pick up the item and smell it. Can you identify what the smell is? This is good to do with a partner who can help you do this. So you close your eyes, block one nostril, identify all three items. Can you do it with both nostrils, right? But if you start to have confusion as to what it is, if you smell coffee, you go, hmm, that smells like burnt toast, right? There could be issues, right? So it's a screening process. It's not a diagnosis. Let's put it that way. There's something called a peanut butter test also that's been used to identify early onset of Parkinson's, right? Parkinson's is a condition where it, it affects um, dopamine. So the peanut butter test, they've used it and they use a measuring tool like a ruler to see how far uh, away from the nostril that they, uh, the patient can smell it. So there are certain distances where they can say, hmm, there's a possibility of Parkinson's. Now, again, this is not a diagnostic test, but it's a, it could be an early indicator. So you need to correlate it with other signs and symptoms. So let's say someone comes in and they are positive for a peanut butter test on smell. You should look to see if that Parkinson type patient might have slowness in movement, rigidity, or what we call hypophonia, where the voice gets very low and they don't have much of a cadence. So you have to correlate it with other um, signs and symptoms. However, it can be a good early screen to whether we have neurodegeneration. Now, I've made other videos on neurodegeneration, so I'll link, link that uh, playlist below. But it's a definite thing you should do as you get older. Uh, or if your parents, you notice your parents are starting to decline a little bit in their memory. So it's, it's best to catch it early. Uh, to have the most impact therapeutically later on if you want to help them. Things like a ketogenic diet can be quite helpful for people who have Alzheimer's dementia. Things like vitamin D are important. So I'll go ahead and make another video on how vitamin D impacts Alzheimer's and dementia and the outcome, okay? Today we're going to talk about the loss of smell and taste following COVID-19. I get this question a lot. How do we improve smell and taste after you get COVID. So we're going to go ahead and address this today. We're going to talk about some of the mechanisms, uh, what's in the research. So let's get right into it. SARS-CoV-2 impacts sustentacular cells of the nasal epithelium, reducing the thickness of the epithelium. The olfactory epithelium is also impacted by the immune cells trying to kill off the virus. Two, the secondary mechanism is respiratory epithelium can replace the olfactory epithelium following an acute inflammatory response. So if after the inflammation, some of the respiratory uh, epithelium will migrate into the nasal or olfactory epithelium, changing its function, right? So that's uh, mechanism number two. Mechanism number three, there's a vascular impact most likely vasoconstriction or basically narrowing of the small vessels into the nasal cavity, uh, decreasing the ability to smell. Number four, inflammation. There's an increase in what we call interleukin-6, which is an inflammatory cytokine, and there's been correlation as to increased IL-6 and loss of smell. So these are the four mechanisms that are uh, currently available as to why you might lose the sense of smell. Why is the sense of smell and taste so important? Because it impacts appetite. So it'll decrease appetite and will promote weight loss. Now for some, they're like, oh, that's great, we can lose weight. But there are some uh, age population where if they lose more weight, it's gonna be a problem. So in the elderly population, especially, it's important that they uh, get their appetite back. 
Number two, it also impacts the, uh, the pleasure centers of the brain. So some people will actually develop depression as a result of not having the pleasure of eating. So eating itself impacts happiness for a lot of people and depression is a uh, uh, end result if you can't smell and taste. Okay, so on this board I have a lot written down. So we're going to take it in sections and in colors. And I also write all of this down in the description below so you can read it and take your time going through it. So I'll step back and you can look at the uh, board right here. And I'm going to explain some of the things that I think is going on. So smell is cranial nerve number one, which is the olfactory nerve. Taste is cranial nerve um, seven, nine, and 10. So seven, the facial nerve, innervates the anterior two-thirds of your tongue, okay, where your taste buds are, right? Cranial nerve number nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve, innervates the posterior one-third of your tongue. And cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, uh, innervates the epiglottis region of, the, of your throat, okay? So these cranial nerves are very important. Why? Because without proper stimulation of those nerve centers or nerves, or the cranial nerves, it will decrease your immune response in the GI tract. It will decrease your hydrochloric acid production in your stomach and your digestive enzymes. So your digestion will slow down. Two, it will decrease GI motility because cranial nerve 10, which is the vagus nerve, is responsible for a lot of the digestive processes and the sympathetic parasympathetic response. So that it has a big impact here. As a result of this, you're going to have bloating, more constipation, and increased food sensitivities in some people, leading to things like SIBO, right, an overgrowth issue with uh, candida and so forth. So this is very important in terms of overall gut function. Now, in terms of treating patients who have loss of smell, we have to do some olfactory retraining. So you can use things like lemon, eucalyptus, clove, peppermint, coffee, anise, peanut butter, right? And you want to smell these uh, scents um, up to like a minute, not each, but total, one minute, three times a day. So every, you know, three or four hours, you're going to take out these smells and you're going to smell it for a minute. So different smells, try to identify it and try to stimulate the olfactory nerve. Number two, taste retraining. You have to be able to do some ta uh, ta tasting. So you can use things like that are sour and bitter, lemons. Uh, I think there was uh, a trend uh, where people were taking oranges and they were kind of grilling them, getting that charred smell and taste along with the, the lemony taste or the uh, orange taste and trying to stimulate the taste buds. Number four, deep diaphragmatic breathing. This is about circulation, which would improve circulation uh, to all the brain areas. Number four, you have to completely chew. Also, singing is also very important because it stimulates cranial num number five, cranial nerve number five, seven, nine, and 10. So being able to chew and sing out loud will stimulate the nervous system. Okay, we talked about different training methods here, uh, things to do. Now, supplements. So in order to improve smell and taste, we have to reduce the inflammation. Things like curcumin and baclin will decrease IL-6. We said increase IL-6 will uh, has a correlation to loss of smell and taste. So we want to decrease IL-6. You want to inhibit fibrosis or scarring, basically. You can use glutathione, which will decrease reactive oxygen species and uh, speed up the epithelial uh, repair process. So you can use these supplements here. You have to support the vasculature because if you have vasoconstriction, you're not getting enough blood flow, and you're not gonna get healing. So you can use vimpositin, ginkgo, and butcher's broom 
to in, uh, support the vasculature and vasodilation to the area, improving the healing process. Another one here, restore mucosal integrity, right? We said there's damage to the mucosa. You can use glutamine, NAC, perilla, and astragalus to decrease the Th2 dominance, or basically immune dominance, okay? And then you also have to improve nerve function. You want lion's mane mushroom, that which will help improve brain function. And you can also use melatonin to help improve or increase brain-derived neurotropic factors. Basically enhances the ability to, to heal some. So this all in combination should be able to restore uh, a lot of patients who have loss of smell and taste. Uh, it's still evolving because there's a lot of people who still can't smell and taste properly. Uh, they may get some improvement, but this is a very comprehensive approach in, to, in terms of how to improve smell and taste post COVID-19. All right, my name is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results, and we'll see you guys next week on the healthy side. Have an awesome day.